So here we are, it's the Yellow Biliteracy section of our program. And first of all, here's the questions document we talked about. And if you, at the table of contents in the front, if you click on that one that says questions, then you'll go right to that part of the document toward the end where we are. So our uh, title was How the Seal of Biliteracy is Transforming the Learning and Teaching of Languages. And we have Veronica Trapani from uh, our Office of Superintendent of Public Instruction and Linda Ignatz and, uh, from the Global Seal and myself kind of moderating and uh, we'll have other people speaking like Emma. And uh, the it's interesting, we're gonna talk um, a lot about nuts and bolts, I think, about seal of biliteracy and the global seal and how to get them and all that kind of stuff. But I think what we're going to get into, especially during that conversation in the Q&A time, is really that question of what does this mean? How is this going to transform the learning and teaching? What do teachers do differently? What do learners do differently? What are we offering and creating? We're sort of creating this um, you know, on the fly in this country right now, and it's quite interesting. I see I put Linda first, but actually it's going to be Veronica. So I am thrilled to introduce Veronica Trapani to you because um, she took the position as was World Languages Program Supervisor. It's now Associate Director for Content, World Languages, and International Education in 2020 in the middle of COVID. If you can imagine someone who was willing to be interviewed and get hired, came to Washington State. I don't think she'd even practically been in her building for months and months. But the minute she arrived, she contacted us in Waffles and all of us who had been pre predecessors in her role. And she is just one of the most collaborative persons I've ever had the fortune of working with. And so she um, had been teaching German and English in Michigan, Tennessee, New York, and Germany. And in 2021, she successfully completed her educational doctorate through Vanderbilt University, focusing on the social and emotional well-being of international students. I heard her presentation at a Waffle Fall Conference, which was wonderful. She also is a member of the National Council of State Supervisors for Language and Accessible, which is our, our national professional organization. And she uh, recently got elected to the board. And she is also currently working with ACTFL. She's really brought this up as her initiative, how to make sure that national board certification for all languages is, um, is happening. Right now, there's a limits. It's really just French and Spanish that allow national board certification. And fortunately, she has a lot of outside interests. I know about the cats, but also soccer, hiking, skiing, and musical theater. So I'm going to turn it over to uh, Veronica. <laughs> there. And so I do have to... I'd forgotten that we had actually gotten tickets to go snowshoeing for Valentine's Day. So I have to leave around like 145, 150, but um, I'm very happy. Any questions that go into the Google Doc, I will get to them first thing on Monday morning. Um, so don't worry if I can't get to your questions or you know if we get there. Um, so I was gonna share just a little bit. I, I actually did pre-record this as well. But um, I just wanted to share a little bit from both my legislative report that I prepared for the legislature and also the proviso report about the seal of biliteracy. Is that all right? Okay. So quick. Oops. Okay. Here we go. So again, this is I have another one pre-recorded, but I just wanted to kind of break it down. Um, I first did want to start off with a land acknowledgement, and let me get this up. Um, I would like to acknowledge the Indigenous people who have stewarded this land since time immemorial and who still inhabit the area today. For me, in Centralia, it's the, the Salish-speaking people of the Confederated Tribes of the Chehalis Reservation, the people of the Sands. And I work, I reflect on the work necessary on my part to break down the barriers created by an educational system built on a settler colonial mindset. My work with the Seal of Bioliteracy focuses on clearing the pathways for tribal, native, and indigenous students to earn credit and recognition for their language skills while acknowledging that language is the center of their culture. So what's going on in Washington right now with the state of world languages? So Washington's K-12 students, as you know, bring a rich heritage of many languages and cultures, and we recognize the importance of multilingual communication skills and valuing cultural backgrounds through the seal of biliteracy. Um, so it's just, you know, here we had, we had, and probably more than this, um, but we had at least 
directly reporting 3,574 graduating seniors earning the seal of biliteracy. That was in 99 school districts. And here's where the key point of heritage language comes in. The seal was earned in 83 languages. Custom testing, which was started with Michelle and then um, at OSPI, continued with Walpold, and then is now back kind of under the umbrella of OSPI, um, has really allowed a lot of heritage languages uh, that wouldn't need, that don't currently have a, a national assessment, such as Fijian, Palauan, et cetera. Some really interesting parts were that um, we had a little bit of a, a shift in the top five, but they are still the same, um, just reordered. So we had Spanish, Russian, Chinese Mandarin, Vietnamese, and French being the top five languages um, assessed. And so again, some of that might have been through AP, especially maybe Spanish or French, but really when we're looking at Russian, Chinese Mandarin, and Vietnamese, a lot of, a lot of those are heritage speakers. <sighs> I just wanted to show some of the trends. Um, and I, I will point out that we did have a, a slight dip in 2020. And part of that was uh, just district reporting. And some of that was also just the pandemic and how things worked out. Um, but you'll see that we had compared to 2016 for 2021, we had almost double the amount of students earning the seal in Spanish. Um, we had a small dip in Chinese Mandarin little in Russian, uh, but really excelled in Vietnamese. So again, we are obviously reaching those heritage language populations. I want to talk a little bit about some of the program changes. Some of these might affect heritage speakers more than others. Um, we did a big uh, rules update at, to the seal of biliteracy where before students were required with their English proficiency to, um, to pass, a, pass the Smarter Balanced Assessment, SBA. But when RCW 28A 655-250 was created, we also a lot of times call it uh, HB 1599, but that is the Graduation Pathways Bill. Uh, that also got rid of uh, a lot of assessment requirements. So we wanted to really make sure that the seal was aligned with what the pathways um, necessitated. And so we did a big, I did a lot of work and this started in November of 2020 and we just got it passed. And now English proficiency um, needs to be proven by graduating and fulfilling ELA requirements. And this can be, and we are really pushing, and this is where a lot of our next steps are in any pathway. There are three pathways. There's your traditional kind of college university prep, um, which kind of, again, you're gonna get like an ACT, SAT requirements, AP, something like that. Um, they have a military. So those students who think they might be interested in going into the military, whether it's the guard, National Guard, or any of the bigger branches, they have to pass the ASVAB. And then we also now have a career and technical education pathway. So again, trying to find ways that we can get those students who traditionally have not been you know, push to either assess for the seal or to take languages to really get them to see the importance of the language in their pathway. And then um, on the other side, for the world languages, we didn't change any of the requirements for the proving proficiency in a language other than English. We just really wanted to clarify that things like ASL and Latin still do count. Um, and we really want to make sure that for our native tribal and indigenous languages that you know, we had um, clear rules about that language is uh, assessed by the tribe or the band, and that we really wanted to make sure educators had their certification in First Peoples language, culture, and oral traditions for any of the 29 federally recognized tribes in Washington. And then Michelle actually brought up, well, what happens if we have a student who wants to assess in a language like Navajo or Diné? And that's not one of our 29 federally recognized tribes. So to kind of head off some of those, we also just said, if you have that, and we do, we do have that data that we have students speaking, you know, tribal languages from other areas of the country here in Washington at home, um, that they should contact the Office of Native Ed. And we are actually looking at, the Office of Native Ed is, is currently in the process of hiring a tribal language program supervisor. So I'm really hoping that we can build out more in collaboration. Um, 
just kind of some, some small basic things was that the number of districts every year has grown. There are some cases where we lose four, five, six, and we can't really know if that's because we didn't have students assessing, which happens. Sometimes it might be a heritage language student and they have no one else assessing, um, but we also tend to gain some back. So again, the seal being earned in 83 languages was one of the highest and most diverse in the entire nation. We had our first four seals given in a tribal language, which is Ichikin, that is the language of the Yakima Nation at Wapato High School. And then really working on creating some new implementation guidance as well as website updates. So I am working and if you are coming and you're gonna look and right now you go to the website and you might say, oh, I don't know where anything is. Don't worry, I don't either. So we are currently, <laughs> I'm working and I, I, I'll tell you, sometimes I have to look for things. So I'm working with our web team. We're really hoping to update, not only just make guidance easier, but listing the assessments and what languages you can currently assess in um, and really making that user friendly. So I understand that again, I didn't, I didn't design the website. That was, that was the agency itself. And uh, we're going through some growing pains with, they did some new branding, but I am on it. Uh, some of the challenges faced by the seal, and a lot of these are kind of perpetual, but we try to eliminate them and, and lower them as much as we can every year. The first one is assessment costs. And, you know, while we have some awesome like stamp, which is $19 for educational settings for Spanish and, and wide range, um, and now, you know, stamp being available in its three skills, it's four skills, it's world speak, and now introducing Spanish monolingual, which is definitely what we're gonna be looking more towards for our heritage speakers who have, um, you know, had instruction in Spanish already. But we have, you know, different issues. So one thing that I did, and again, as suggested by Michelle, was we have a contract, OSPI does, with um, the Avant Assessment and a new partnering a platform called Extempore. And so we decided upon about 17 or 18 different languages that had a decent, they were super less commonly taught languages. And so we had a look at the data. So we had this many speakers coming up in like sixth through 12th grade. And then we had to see where we had given, uh, Waffle had had custom tests before, we kind of aligned them. And so now there is a contract where up to $5,000 um, OSPI is paying for those assessments to really help create some language equity. Um, again, it doesn't mean that every super less commonly taught language, but we are working on finding more evaluators and really, I think, reaching into heritage and, and community areas to try to find assessors and raters and get them trained so that way we can have more assessments at a lower cost. The other side is district reporting issues. And so later on, you will hear from Emma Shirk, but sometimes it's not user-friendly as to how we are labeling who gets the seal, when is it awarded, what do we need? So um, in fact, just yesterday, I am working with our student information team and we are working on cleaning up um, some of the, the bugs that have been in there and also adding more assessments. Uh, so approved assessments through OSPI so I think we're really on a good path for addressing both sides of these of this issue. And finally, I have some future opportunities. And the first one is the one down the bottom, really looking at partnerships within OSPI and outside, um, the Office of Native Education, and then our Migrant and Multilingual Education Division is really important. Um, and again, while dual, while multilingual ed a lot is, is different uh, from world languages, we are still very much aligned um, in that understanding of proficiency, making sure students, we wanna get teachers the correct data so they know where and how much and the types of um, you know, work that teachers need to help students. And then also working very closely with our career and technical ed team, especially our family and consumer sciences and working outside with the American Translators Association and really looking at how we can start building out some interpretation and translation programs uh, at the skill centers and hopefully also in the high schools. Um, if you know anything about CTE, they're really interested in what they call equivalencies, meaning when a student is taking uh, a translation class, 
what class is it also getting credit for at maybe the, the comprehensive high school? So it, it could be for our language neutral interpretation and translation programs, that could be business English, you know, getting credits and still making sure that they are credits that will, um, will apply for if a student wants to go to any of the community colleges or four-year universities that they also recognize those. Um, or if they're doing something more specific like Spanish for healthcare, getting them Spanish credits uh, that, or elective credits if they've already you know, assessed for the seal and earned their four. And then finally, looking at um, more approved assessment options, going really, we want to expand more into the assessments that are more language specific. You know, unfortunately, I received an email this past week where uh, a student who was in eighth grade and is a heritage French speaker took the DELE, the D-E-L-E, which is one of their the French um, diploma, one of the French specific um, assessments. And I have to say, oh, that's not approved. I can't give her credit. However, you know, I think it's great. We are looking at expanding, but you might want to take, you know, stamp or something else so we can get that going. But I don't want to have to say no like that. And then again, updated, more intuitive CEDARS reporting and hopefully aligning more with what our um, emerging multilingual students and our English learners, how they get reported. We'd really love to see that on the side of world language and heritage language as well. And um, I will put this in the chat if you want to contact me, uh, just veronica.trapani at k12.wa.us. And that is my cell phone, my work cell phone. So I'm here. And uh, that's that's it for me. <laughs> I'm gonna stop sharing somehow. Great. Does uh, are there any questions right now for Veronica? Um, I believe you can put them in the Q and A, uh, and I've uh, also put a few links to different things there. And if not, we'll just dive right into Linda. I think. All right. Great. Oh, well, yes. before you go, though, <laughs> before all right. you start, let me uh, let me go back and at least give my little brief bio, which for you, which <laughs> <laughs> one second. OK, did I share that? Oh, no, nope, wrong person. Sorry. Oh, there we are. OK, Linda has a long bio on the seal of uh, the Global Seal website because she has done so many, many things. And, and so in this context, we're highlighting the fact that she is the founding executive director of the Global Seal of Biliteracy um, in, since 2018. So it's actually a very recent thing. We've been talking about it since the very beginning. So it's very exciting. She was an educator in Lincoln Way Community High School, District Number 210, and taught all levels of Spanish. And she's also president-elect of the Joint National Committee for Languages, the National Council for Languages and International Studies, which just had language advocacy days, which were fabulous last week, okay. and the Illinois Council on the Teaching of Foreign Languages, and she was president in 2013-14. Uh, she's also taught as an adjunct at, at DePaul University, Purdue University, and Joliet, Juliet or Joliet, anyway, junior college. And she's had many awards. A big one with the one that's most memorable to me is the 2014 Actful National Teacher of the Year, which is an amazing place to have a platform to really advocate for languages. She is a popular keynote speaker and consultant and has been all over the place doing that. And we really got to know each other because we were both invited by the Hawaii Department of Education to speak to them about our work on, on our state seals of biliteracy in Washington and, and uh, Linda in Illinois. Uh, was that 2016? Something like that. Maybe. <laughs> anyway, we had a wonderful time and it really cemented our joint commitment to this work and especially to uh, really bringing in all languages. And in the, in Hawaii, of course, was mostly concerned about the status of Hawaiian and indigenous other languages from that area and or that are found on that, those islands, I should say. And um, so they've done some amazing things. So Linda, thank you. No, thank you, Michelle. Michelle's been an incredible mentor to me on really meeting the needs and and thinking about inclusion in terms of the heritage languages so too often um, languages learned outside of traditional high school classrooms are, are, are it's not that they're ignored people just don't even know they exist and I think that that's been just um, an incredible space for growth for me just as a as a student and a learner 
of, um, I mean, every week I hear about a language I didn't even know existed. So it, that's been an incredible journey. And I truly want to, before I do anything else, is give an incredible shout out to you, Veronica, to, you know, to Washington, all of those school districts. 83 languages is not, I mean, that is not something just to be proud of. That is something to celebrate like, like with fireworks. I mean, that is incredible. I'm um, speaking to you all from New York, where I'm at the, um, have participated in two conferences this week, the one NABE, the National Association of Bilingual Educators, and secondly, the Northeast Conference on the Teaching of Foreign Languages. And I met this week, I had lunch with the New York City Department of Education, and they identify here in New York City over 200,000 languages that are spoken just here in the city, and yet their state seal of biliteracy last year was only issued in 46 languages. And so this is the challenge that we all have is how are we going to create these um, really important collaborations to be able to identify um, and measure the language skills of these incredibly linguistically talented and gifted students. And, you know, it honors not just their heritage and their culture, um, but, you know, their bilingualism as an asset. And I think, you know, we, that is, you know, it's a big struggle. And so really, truly that, um, you know, the state seal is important. Um, we have a number of districts that participate in both programs, but the state seal is the first time state entities, gov state governments and legislators have really said, being bilingual is an asset. It's something to be recognized and celebrated, but more importantly, being able to start collecting the data about who are these bilingual speakers in our state and the, you know, sort of the linguistic richness um, and opportunity they provide to us in, in, in our communities. So I, you know, truly applaud all that you've done as a state. I know Michelle's been a driving force behind that, but she hasn't done it alone. So all of you part collaborators, um, you know, it's just been such a joy to, to work with all of you. And so um, the Global Seal is just really truly an extension of that state steel vision. Um, one of our, the things that I guess we're fortunate in is that we don't have to work through legislators or administrators or state, you know, governments. So if we say, hey, this would be a really great idea for learners, we can just do it. And um, that's great, in, you know, it's th that independence um, is joyful. <laughs> so, um, because it, it really truly is about how do we um, maximize as well as recognize our language learners. And so the Global Seal of Biliteracy, and Michelle said this was a conversation, so I'm just going to chat, and then I really do want to welcome a lot of questions, was born really as a gap filler for these spaces where, for example, uh, you know, the state still didn't have an opportunity. Uh, we see, for example, most state seals are, are rec it is a recognition point for our high school seniors, but we have heritage, these community-based heritage programs that are meeting on a weekend or a weeknight um, that may not connect well with some, or, or have um, opportunities to connect with maybe the public school. We see a lot of dual language programs where students are coming um, into those middle school years with significant language skills. And Washington has really created some sort of interesting ways to recognize them earlier. But in some cases, a state seal of biliteracy may not allow them to be even tested until they're a senior year for that recognition. And so we really wanna think about providing um, what I call not just a trophy, but really a, a language credential that they can use in their next steps, whether those are for academic credit um, at the college level or advanced placement, or more importantly, as a job tool to, to document and evidence a language skill. And I think we, you know, just my caution is always, let's not call it an award because awards are nice um, or a trophy. They're, they're, again, they're great. They recognize an achievement, but they're usually given at the end of the race. And we want these language learners to continue that language learning sequence. So I love the, love the idea of working with schools and states and districts to be able to provide an ongoing sort of sequencing of awards. And so the, the Washington State Seal of Biliteracy is that intermediate mid, we also have with the global seal, our first level of credential at intermediate mid, we call that 
functional fluency. That's the place where they're independent language users. They can go out and do things on their own. It might not be pretty and it might not be perfect, but they're successful. And that's exactly the feeling we want them to have. We don't want them to think that they have to know more before they can really use their language in a practical way um, to communicate with others. But we also want them to know that that's not the end of the game that those language skills can be leveled up so that you, know, you can enjoy um, you know, not just a career in a language, but the culture and the, the richness of literature and other um, things that can you, that you need more language to access. So we do offer a three-tiered pathway. Um, so we begin at that functional fluency at intermediate mid, our next level, and so for many of our heritage language learners, this is where they begin, is at the next level when they're tested, is at advanced low on the actual scale, which is our working fluency. And then we have yet another tier above that at advanced mid, which we call professional fluency. And what's really exciting about um, uh, many of the language tests, not all, but some of those that Veronica was mentioning, for example, the stamp tests, is that when you have a four skill test option, students realize that they, they have strengths and they have weaknesses. And so they have something to be excited about and, and an area that um, provides them with some, some formative feedback to improve on. But what we really see that's exciting is gamification of language learning. Because when they receive a four skill test, oftentimes we see the interpretive, the, the listening and those reading skills at one or even two sub levels above where their lower skill is, where their, their writing skill is or their speaking skill. And that's really powerful because the students say, wow, I'm almost to the next level. So I'm going to keep taking language because I've already I got, um, you know, I'm already there in one skill. I just have to work on this other skill. And for those of you that are in heritage language programs, we see that a lot that we see, for example, an advanced level skill for listening because they've been listening to mom and dad and grandma and aunts and uncles their whole life. But maybe on the literacy side, on the reading or the writing side, they may still be into the, in the novice level range. And so what those diagnostics provide is some strategies for you as whether you're as a parent or as a teacher or a school to say, you know, this information informs our instruction and helps us better meet our students' needs because to qualify for a seal of biliteracy, be it the state seal or the global seal, they have to do that in every category. So the global seal is really born to create a longer sequence of language learning well into you know, the university level and adults. Um, if you're in a heritage community, you know, invite your adults to come in and earn a credential and demonstrate their own skill as an example. So just a few sort of data points about the global seal. Um, I mentioned that we have the three tiers of language certification. We offer that in over 130 different languages. Now, we haven't yet issued awards, sadly, in all 130, but I have a goal. <laughs> And I think, you know, that that's the that is the challenge. I mean, and that's 130 through actual testing. So we don't have like the portfolio option. We don't have some of these special options, but we we can meet a number of different needs. And I was really um, excited to kind of look and see what your top languages were. So one of the things that, you know, we looked at here for the Global Steel. And again, we say global because we've issued awards in 48 um, US states as well as the District of Columbia. And it looks like next week we'll, we'll, we'll be adding our 49th state. So we're just waiting to process that particular um, school certificate. So it'll be adding the 49th. But we've also worked in six other countries and that number continues to grow. And so, um, our, the, at this point, our first languages, <laughs> we've um, issued awards in uh, 19 different first languages at this point, um, and then tested second languages. Um, we are of our top seven languages. Our first um, is Spanish, uh, second French, third might surprise you. It is Polish is our number three nationally in the US, followed by German, 
um, after German, interestingly, is um, English. So that is our fifth most common language. Then comes another surprise potentially, which is Hebrew. And our last of the top seven um, is Chinese. And that includes, that, 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 so that's both the simplified as well as traditional. So I just sort of combine those numbers. Um, our top five states, um, our, top, our, our top seven states, I guess I have is New Jersey, uh, New Mexico, Ohio, Indiana, Oregon, California, and coming in seventh place is my state of Illinois. But what is really exciting, because we offer the three tiers, is to see some of the differences in terms of where our language learners are on that sort of proficiency pathway towards um, greater amounts of proficiency. So among our middle schoolers, we see 93% of our middle school students at the functional fluency level which is, um, you know, basic, you know, it's not very sophisticated. It's not necessarily long or organized paragraphs. Um, there's going to be some errors and some mistakes, but again, they're completely, they're able to read, write, speak, and listen um, in that language. But that means that there are 7% of our middle schoolers who are actually at the advanced low level in the language that they were tested. And for the global seal, we require on the first language side, an ed, either a test or an educational level requirement. So for example, um, you heard for the, the Washington State SEAL, it would be that sort of English language requirement for graduation. So we actually have an eighth grade graduation requirement for our functional fluency. And for our working fluency, either a high school graduation requirement similar to yours, or a test. That means these 7% of our middle schoolers who have qualified have tested in both languages, not just met a school requirement. So that's, that's pretty, I mean, that's pretty exciting because that's the work of our dual language programs and that's the work of our heritage school programs. So those are typically the two programs there. Um, at the high school level, it shifts quite a bit. And we see about 85% of our high school students at the functional fluency level and 15% at the working. So that's almost doubled in that sort of four year kind of period of time. What's probably interesting and maybe even a little disappointing <laughs> is that the Global Seal also works with um, universities and higher ed programs. About 25% of our credentials are issued to higher ed uh, universities and colleges to their students, but it doesn't shift very much. Um, from the 85% of functional fluency or intermediate mid for our higher school students, it's 84% at higher ed. So our high school students are doing, you know, there's more. Um, but that 15% is about the same. What's different is 1% is now at the professional fluency or our advanced high level, but not a large percentage. Um, we see it, it sort of, it almost mirrors the, the sort of high schoolers. Uh, and so we could all, you know, wonder why, <laughs> but, um, but those are the, that's what the data says. And we're looking at thousands and thousands of tests. Among our adults, the numbers shift greatly. So we have a number of working adults that have tested for the global seal. 57% uh, are at that intermediate mid of functional fluency, but 40% have tested at the working fluency or advanced low, and an additional 3%, much smaller, at the advanced high or our, work, our professional fluency in that second language. So it's, um, you know, it's interesting to see some of these numbers. We also track um, our English language learners, current or former, and about 20 to 25%, um, depending upon, um, the, you know, that's sort of our cumulative. In 2021, 17% were previous English language learners and 10% were current lang English language learners who achieved at least one of our tiers of, of uh, fluency. So that's kind of, you know, so we're really sort of proud of that. 
Um, the global seal grew 86% last year over the previous year. Um, and that continues to kind of sort of astound us um, and keeps us working really hard. But it, our, our goal really truly is to find better pathways and collaborations with these less commonly and more diverse languages. Again, you know, here, I, you know, there were in the last 20, the last state report, state a national report for the individual state seals of biliteracy, there were only seven states that had recognized 25 or more languages. Um, obviously, Washington, you guys are like the superstars. <laughs> Everybody looks to you. Um, but that the, that has to change. We have America is truly a bilingual space. And one of the things that we really try to do in terms of our, our work with the Global Seal is how can we better support your language learners? So in addition to answering questions, that's a question I have for you. Like, what can we do to better support your language learners? We tend, we like to do things directly for the language learner. So one of the things Global Seal has done is created our global cred um, CREDS being sort of an acronym for certifying and recognizing excellence and determination. Remember the long haul language journey pathway, but also just the idea of getting some street cred. What's your, you know, your language cred? Because unless we recognize something as being worth certifying and paying for in the job skill market, it's not going to go very much recognized at the educational level. And so we really believe that providing um, our learners with whether it's a state or a global seal credential, a credential is different from an award. It's not just a nice to have, it's something useful. Um, a credential is earned by, de, by a de facto authority, a test in this case, and, it, it, and a, a credential represents skills not just necessarily knowledge, but skills that have been evidenced and demonstrated. And every student, whether it's a state or global seal has done that. And it is, it, it is worth giving them the tool. So um, one of the things the global seal does that is a little unique is we have a serial numbered credential so that it can be entered in on LinkedIn. It can be, uh, goes right under licenses and certifications and it can be transcripted. Um, and, you know, next week when we do our next gl uh, global cred event for college and career, we're going to be talking about how individual global seal recipients will be able to share their own credential digitally. So they'll be able to send a digital form of their certificate to an employer, but also on social media and some other things. So that's sort of our sort of overall approach. Um, our application process is fairly simple. We take in a little bit of, uh, you know, contact information so we know who to call if we have questions. We ask that the school or the organization fill out a form that um, lists all of their qualifying candidates. Um, I always say spell those names correctly because we're a free program. And so to we have to we automate as much as we can so we don't have to pay labor. And one of those automations is that form that you fill out is what auto populates the certificate and what's so if you misspell the student's name it'll be misspelled on their certificate sadly so um, to avoid that you know we ask you to be careful as you fill that in um, it's just an excel form and then we ask that you submit to us a scanned copy of the student scores uh, we trust that you um, you know that they, they that those are the valid scores and that's why we use a you know a group process. Um, the Global Seal does have an individual process, in which case the test company would send the scores directly to us. So again, we are sure of the credibility and validity of the scores. But um, again, we can do that on both the actual scale as well as the CEFR scale and lots of different languages. So I think I've been talking way too long. So I'd like to turn it back to Michelle, who is coordinating everything, I think. <laughs> I think uh, Russ is kind of coordinating, holding us together here, but um, uh, we'll, I mean, obviously we're gonna have more conversation here in just a moment. So I think I, I what I'd like to do is, is actually take just a moment to um, 
share the screen to just go over to where Global Cred is so that you can think about attending this. You can sign up to attend it. It's on Thursday, it's coming Thursday. And last year's was amazing. Um, we actually have some videos from that Maria Carrera did and that I did uh, last year, but uh, it's definitely worthwhile going. There'll be live sessions and lots of great stuff. I, I think there's other resources as well. So um, what I'm gonna do now is, is share some data about where we have been leveraging for heritage learners, the state seal and the global seal together, because we think that is the best of all worlds, at least best of all worlds in terms of what we have available at the moment. So um, let's see, I'll just, this is my little intro slide, which I just created. So there would be some reference for people who came and watched this later. But basically, um, I, the, the reason I'm presenting this right now is because I have been working with the Star Talk program and the Gen Cyber that were part of the Heritage Language Symposium this morning, as well as a uh, Heritage Language grant funded by our state, OSPI, um, out of the Office of Multilingual Education. And this is where we I'll, I will share some data from those programs. So the first one is this grant, and I'll just tell you a little bit about it. It um, the the grant was offered through our office, and and there uh, they they offered a number of places to get the the funding for it. It, has, it comes through a school district. We were partnered last year with Evergreen Public Schools, and because of my personal language interests of Russian and Romanian, uh, we picked those languages. Those are also pretty pretty sizable languages in our state. And then we also did Spanish to try to have a little bit more of us in school kind of presence to the to the program. Uh, the program was designed with uh, sort of starting with the end in mind. There are two primary goals for the students who participate in the program. One is to work toward their global competence certificate, which is a portfolio website that they create. And we were encouraging them to create it in their heritage language and, and with some English components if possible so that uh, the World Affairs Council team could evaluate it. And that would be sort of the vehicle to give them reason to work on improving their whatever, whichever their language skills they felt needed more work. And then as part of the program, we would also pay for their testing. And they would, if possible, if they qualified for the state seal, they would also qualify for the global seal of biliteracy if they completed the English assessment. And we used the stamp English test this last spring because um, of the remote proctoring was available and so on. So I'm gonna just give you a little bit of data on that. Again, the, as Linda mentioned, the Global Seal has two levels. That was something that was really important to us because we wanted to motivate the students to reach beyond just intermediate level if they could. And, if, and again, if they can see that in at least some areas they were already at the advanced level, then that would kind of give them a push. The other thing is that we had a lot of students who were 14, 15, they were a long ways away from high school graduation and we wanted them to have recognition as you know, immediately basically. And so that was part of our motivation. So here's just some um, uh, summary of our data uh, out of the, the program. We were aiming to have about 20 students per language. It was a bit smaller for Russian and Spanish, probably closer to 14. Um, but uh, the students who were able to make the time, it was a very packed spring for them and it had to be done before end of June when the grant ended this last spring. Uh, those that took the time to test, almost all of them qualified as proficient for the state seal of biliteracy. That means they had overall intermediate mid across all languages skills. Most of them came into the program lower in literacy, and so they were really working to develop literacy skills, very similar to uh, the work that Svetlana and um, Eduardo described this morning. So um, of those, uh, what was interesting is that, uh, say of the Romanians, eight were at the intermediate mid level, or they have, might have some skills higher, but overall intermediate mid. So we, sub we submitted for them to get functional fluency, but five got working fluency. That meant in both English and in Romanian, and for Romanian, they used the Alta language testing, uh, they had qualified at advanced low. And so that's significant. Uh, the Russian students, uh, some of them did not take the English test, so we didn't, we weren't able to award them um, the, uh, the working fluency. None of them got to that level uh, with English. And then for Spanish, we had one and three that qualified for functional fluency. So probably one of them didn't take the English test. 
this is, I have to say, this is phenomenal results because remember we were in the middle of COVID-19 and all of the chaos of last year. So the fact that the students really stuck with this uh, work and, uh, and took the tests and, and got the results is quite amazing. We will be continuing that grant in the coming year. Uh, we were funded again with a different school district. So we're in the process of doing that. And we actually also just got requested in the last couple of weeks to add Ukrainian as a language. So we'll be adding that as well. The next date I want to share is from the Star Talk and the Gen Cyber Grants. As you, if you were here this morning and heard the presentations there, you know that they took place as remote programs this summer, and so uh, they did again out of Russian Star Talk. Nine students qualified as uh, for our state seal of biliteracy as proficient. They would only earn the seal, of course, if they graduated high school. But those nine uh, were at functional fluency level, which is great. The Gen Cyber Portuguese had eight that were at functional fluency and Gen Cyber Spanish had five that were at functional fluency. Again, some of them may have had uh, higher skills that might've been closer to working fluency, but um, they, uh, they weren't overall at that advanced low level. So I wanted to go back a year to look at uh, the previous Star Talk program, which was in uh, 2019, because in 2020, all the programs got canceled. This is actually illustrative and part of the reason that we felt so motivated to uh, work with the Global Seal of Biliteracy so that we could recognize the students where they really were, not just where they, you know, it's, I mean, it's great to get the state seal of biliteracy at intermediate mid proficiency, but they, if they're higher, we should be recognizing that as well. So that year, 18 students qualified as proficient. There were 19 students in this, in the program. One was still intermediate low in writing. Um, but seven, if they, if we'd had the global seal at that time, which we didn't, we weren't, uh, I guess it, well, it was launching at that time, but uh, we were not in a position to, uh, to go for it at that time. Uh, seven would have got functional fluency and 11 would have got working fluency. So um, that would have been amazing. And that's part of why we we're so motivated in that direction. Um, so I think with that, we're going to just jump into a little conversation with us. I know Veronica has to leave shortly. So first of all, thank you, Veronica, for being here. And um, we'll, uh, we'll see you next time. Uh, so I would like to start with if there's any questions that have come up. Uh, uh, yeah, great, great. OK, great. And, and Veronica placed her report in there. If there's any questions, we can take a moment for those. And then I'm super excited that um, we've got Emma Shirk to join us today. and. Um, she has a really important part that relates to this idea of transforming teaching and learning. So uh, what she'll be describing is not, is not directly connected to the credentialing, but it is connected to taking the time to actually assess where students are at. So I'm seeing one question Q&A. Oh, thank you, wonderful. All right, thank you. Thank you, Donna. Um, so Emma, do you, have, do you wanna share a PowerPoint or are you able to share? get that started. Okay, great. Yeah, so Emma, I don't, I didn't, I should have gotten a little bio for you. We, we kind of, uh, Emma, Emma's presentation came into uh, connecting with our effort this time a little later than the original uh, schedule for this. And so I didn't get everything lined up for her, but um, the work she's doing is really amazing. And I love that expanding access is kind of the whole point. So I'll just turn it over to her. Um, so I'll, I'll just kind of speak quickly and tell you where I'm coming from. So I am a district language specialist. I support our multilingual program. I was originally a dual language high school teacher um, and moved through this language world from that direction. And we had a very interesting sort of fall. <laughs> and one of the reasons why we were able to do it is because our district is 50% multilingual walking in the door. So we have a moral imperative to do everything we do from a multilingual perspective rather than from a monolingual perspective. So we were lucky we also got one of the heritage grants from OSPI and we had plans to reinitiate and further develop out our Spanish heritage language program. Um, but something else happened instead and we went a little faster than we thought we were going to. All of this work is connected to our district's racial equity policy and our framework for multiliteracy. So in September, 
I ran into our world language department chair at Mount Vernon High School, who was incredibly worried about the around 100 students who were heritage language learners who had been placed indiscriminately in Spanish 1 and Spanish 2. And I know this is something that was uh, mentioned in some of the questions for of you know, how do you help counselors understand that? And so he had that problem and his teachers had that problem, but I had also started for our English language development program, a process of insisting that every member of the TBIP program, every student who served through that model also is tested for all other languages. So we know their heritage language proficiencies and can leverage those when we're designing instruction, either for language programs or where we are helping provide access to meaning, meaningful access to their regular instruction um, through grade level classes or above. So we had these two intersecting issues where we had a grant that was given. So I had a budget code. We had budgeted for massive testing and our district supported us, our high school supported us and we tested over 350 students in the month of September to try to fix this. The way we did it was a little quick and dirty and we're gonna be having a much cleaner process in the, for next year because the first thing we had to do was identify all of those Spanish one students who never should have been there. But we also were then about to have a fairly large internal database of Spanish testing. So we didn't want to miss anybody. And we also wanted to make sure that our classes were actually at the right level. So in addition to anyone who we thought might not be or who self-identified as inappropriately placed in Spanish 1, we also tested all Spanish 2 and Spanish 3 students. This resulted in 154 schedule changes, a master schedule of a comprehensive high school changed in October. We had two Spanish threes converted to AP Spanish language for heritage learners. We had a uh, Spanish one converted to a college in the high school to two. A lot of movement. <laughs> we had students say, hey, I wanna take French. I earned four credits. I wanna move over to the French program. So we had some pretty exciting things happen. Um, and, that was painful for our counselors and they did amazing work supporting our students. And I think that was the biggest thing we could have done to get an administrative office, counseling office understanding of what it means to be a heritage learner. It was only possible because access than our world language teachers who had been naming this problem for years. But Emma, I was could also you the repeat that? Could you repeat that? You froze for just a minute, at least for me. Oh, sorry. My internet with the, the um, camera is not always great. I'm on Whidbey Island. Um, so <laughs> the only reason why this works is because it was a collaboration between our world language teachers and program and our multilingual services program because most, as we know, most language educators in the K-2 system do not have the support of a multilingual administrator or program coordinator, but we do. <laughs> and so we had, were able to leverage connections that wouldn't have been possible any other way. We also had the OSPI grant and district resources that had already committed in the prior year to never charge a student for competency credit testing. This is especially important because we are um, a district that serves room experience. And so anytime we charge anyone for anything, it takes five times as long. But then I'm also our, we are, was ELPA, now WIDA coordinator. So I could leverage all of the systems for state testing for this test. I don't think our experience argues for anything as strongly as it argues for treating this test the same as we treat any other testing in the state. 
and we had connections to the registrar's office. So we actually found some of our middle school dual language students who had earned the proficiency required for the seal of biliteracy and had not been awarded it because the dual language program was not connected to the seal of biliteracy framework um, testing system that existed at the high school. So we were able to fix a lot of problems. <laughs> this is what happened. It's February and we have already tested 396 students for competency credits. We already have 72 people who have earned the proficiency required for the state seal. And we have a lot of students asking when they get to test for the global seal. This opportunity where we have so many students who've tested that our minority language students are going to have their own testing session. So we're gonna be able in the spring to reach all of our Marshallese speakers, our Korean speakers, and all of the students who've been kind of locked out of being recognized as heritage learners who could be um, having that seal of biliteracy, but also just seen for who they are. We've had a lot of impact on instruction and I'll just skip through because I think we all know where, what happens when you know who's in your room and who's in your school rather than guessing. Um, but I will say one of the most just back for his students the thing that he told me and the principal Emma Emma catch do it repeat one more time if you could oh I'm sorry it's okay um, so we had one of our our teachers who was involved in this process is a heritage learner himself and his response to seeing what his students could achieve was to say well I'm not going to speak so slowly and I'm going to use my dialect so it's been a humanizing process for teachers as well as students, and that only has a positive effect on instruction. We also um, are, are making our exit point into our grade level Spanish classes, not into world level language classes. So once students take two years of heritage language or are able to complete what's necessary at the second level of heritage language, if that's where they place, they would be going into our Spanish language arts classes, <laughs> not into um, a world language class because we need to provide students with advanced proficiency tasks and opportunities. And there's this one thing that happened. <laughs> which is also why this should be a state sponsored test. One of the students who tested for us was their only mainstreamed class was Spanish. All other classes were in a specialized special education program. And through testing the student, finding that they were a heritage speaker with a vast language resource network available to them, we were able to both reinitiate TBIP services that had somehow been stopped for the student, been lost to the system, and also have conversations with the special education department who had believed that any student had to have writing proficiency to be placed in a class other than Spanish one. Well, we have text-to-speech, we have an IEP for the student, why would we require that? And also, why wouldn't we be having them in a heritage class with their peers? So the Spanish teachers who are extreme advocates for inclusionary practices, as they should be, were able to get the student placed in the right way. And we're on a process over the next year or so to ensure that all students who are also receiving specially designed instruction are receiving access to our heritage language program if Spanish is their heritage language. I wish we had more. Um, if anyone knows a Ukrainian speak, teacher, please let me know. Um, so like I said, this has changed the structure of our testing. We are going to be offering a testing session just for languages that have not 
uh, previously been tested. We are wrapping our dual language testing into this whole piece because we're trying to see all three language programs, our world language program, our heritage language program, and our dual language program as a continuum of opportunity for students to reach their full linguistic potential. But that means curriculum adoption. So we're starting this spring to look at all of the curriculum to make sure that it's appropriate for our students, especially considering that the majority are heritage learners. And so we need to have different materials and we need to have different training for our teachers. We have a smaller number of dual language trained teachers than we do of world language trained teachers. And it would be great if everyone could be trained in all methodologies. But then there's also the I'm the TBIP person, I'm the multilingual services person. So we're also designing a training to roll out that will help any educator look at language proficiency scores in languages other than English and understand the assets that that child is bringing into their classroom. And that for me is incredibly exciting. So that's, that's kind of where we're at. Um, our, we have some other challenges. We do. Um, we've got a significant number of Mixteco speakers, so we need Thunsavi testing. We also have Triki speakers, and we need an opportunity to ensure that all of our Indigenous students, not just those whose traditional lands are now Washington State, are able to access testing. of ASL that we want to make sure also have the opportunity. Our district has never um, offered that chance and we are, are hoping to be able to do so in a culturally appropriate way that honors the students and everything that they are bringing to our classes. So that's, that's where we're at. Um, so that's the district perspective on some of these, these things that are happening in Washington state and, and the ways that maybe some partnerships can make it go a little faster than we might've thought. So. Thank you. Thank you so much, Emma, for joining us. And uh, I, I bet both Maria and Linda are gonna wanna pick your brain a bit because I think this is what we've always dreamed of is that a district would sort of stop everything and really take a look. But the thing is that it takes somebody in the right position. So like, for example, when I was in a position that was around world language or even dual language, I wasn't in, uh, what we call T, you know, bilingual education. Now it's called multilingual education in our state. And so I had a partner, so we could do a lot with testing and everything, but it was hard to get into do anything with the students themselves because that wasn't like my area of responsibility. But with a partners like Veronica now at OSPI, Patty Finnegan with uh, in the multilingual education, and and now because she's explicitly supporting dual language and heritage language, and then a district person like Emma, I think we can we can really go someplace. And Patty and Emma have and Veronica and me when I can make it, um, we've been meeting uh, every week for several weeks now to really look at how the data systems, like how the districts uh, uh, report data around everything pretty much related to these things to the state and what the state does with them and all that, how those can be improved. And Emma's on the ground, so she knows what it's like with the registrars, the counselors, those people have to really be influenced. But you know, when I saw Emma present around this work uh, to our professional learning uh, community with uh, uh, the Heritage Language Grants uh, last fall, I felt like, hmm, what would it take to get this happening like at the college level? And shouldn't it be happening? I mean, honestly, but anyway, um, so, Please, uh, if I'm sorry that we're in a webinar format and uh, we can't just see everybody's face right at the moment, but if you put something in the, uh, the, P, the uh, chat, that would be great. And I see Donna Lansbury has just suggested if that you should, that well, if she's asked if it's gonna be presented at the Pacific Northwest Council for Languages, which is our regional mm -hmm. conference that's happening in, uh, in March. 
And uh, Emma, that would be amazing if you would submit something, but we can be in touch, Donna. Why don't we be in touch with Emma and encourage her to do that? There are both recorded versions and live, so you can kind of pick the format that would work best. So other questions? Michelle, I keep thinking about what you said. What would it take to do this kind of thing at the college level? A miracle, Michelle. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, you know, a, a number of us were at the JNCL Language Advocacy Days, and there is a bill that's been worked on for a couple of uh, couple of years now, BEST, it's called Bilingual Education, Seal and Teaching, or Bilingual, um, no, Biliterate, Biliteracy, Education, Seal and uh, Teaching. And uh, I've met with uh, the senator who's behind that, uh, Schrantz from uh, uh, Hawaii, and his staff, and I've talked about, I feel that a strong priority is to get sort of a national approach to access to assessments for these less commonly taught languages. But another aspect is the kind of attitudinal stuff, the comprehensive understanding, who needs to be at the table to understand why language is at the foundation of all success in education, period. <laughs> and so when we completely uh, ignore a part like you were describing, Emma, part of a student's language person, who they are in their identity and the language skills themselves, then we cannot possibly hope to have them be successful like we claim we are going to do in our educational systems. Uh, so another initiative there is to actually get languages, world languages and the other language besides English <laughs> Uh, it better represented within the Department of uh, Education at the federal level. Uh, so that would be a great help if we really took a multilingual approach. And um, anyway, so those are a couple of initiatives, but questions, more questions. Well, I just gotta say too, a district like mine is gonna be sending university students that are going to have advanced proficiency. So how can we partner as well? How can we help you prepare for who's coming in? We all know we're feeder schools. Well, I, I, I just, the session that I offered here at NECTFL was on how to use the seal of biliteracy as, as an articulation tool for higher ed. And the room, you know, was probably three fourths um, higher ed individuals and about maybe one fourth, maybe less than a fourth teachers, uh, high school teachers, and then there were a few others. But the big piece is that it's like, how do you, I think part of it is that articulation, but part of it is how does it one, one solve the other's need and, you know, and vice versa. And so one of the huge issues, obviously, at the higher ed space is placement. And, you know, they have oftentimes have, you know, the placement tested that they never really like very much. Um, and then there's somebody that somewhere during the summer, the student has to come in and take the placement test or they put they place them inappropriately and then they get moved and there's all of this shuffling around. But when a student comes in with a recent sort of seal of biliteracy proficiency test, then they come in ready to place. So one of the things that Illinois did, and it is in Illinois by legislation, is that our higher ed programs at the, in the state system were tasked with aligning their curriculum with actful proficiency levels. And what that meant was that if a student has a test score, they know exactly where to place them. And so that, that, that is a piece of the solution. But the other piece is if we look at the sheer numbers. So if we look at that 2020 seal, uh, state seal of biliteracy report, and there's 100,000 students receiving a state seal that have a intermediate, mid, or above language skills. And wouldn't those be the students that a university would want to fill their third year programs that are dying on the vine? And so I think those are, it is it is getting the word out and it's one of the things that I know at least for me on global still that's become a real mission space because they they eat they need each other but neither knows what the other needs or is doing or has to offer and so I think you know that space the other piece that I think um, can be really helpful um, especially when we look at these less common languages and heritage language spaces is what can we do at the community college level because many times these are the students that are you know they're at a local going to a local program and community colleges have been truly the heroes in 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 not having a lot of 
you know, they don't, they, they love being able to provide competency-based credits. I mean, that's really a lot of their task. Their task is to open up, you know, whatever it is that that student needs gen ed wise to be able to get into a four year college program and meet one of the, the barriers across the country for four year programs is a student, whether they were an EL or they have a heritage language, if they don't have a documented high school language because it's not wasn't required for graduation, then that means that precludes them from four-year college entry. Mm -hmm. And so one of the spaces that we can do with the seals of biliteracy, and again, in Illinois, you know, you've been doing that with your competency-based credit in Washington. Here in, in my state of Illinois, we have, it is a part of the seal of biliteracy that it counts as that high school language piece on their transcript. But can we, you know, if we can look at that and begin to work with community colleges to be language testing centers, similar to what Waffle is, be, is being doing and providing. Because if they can do that, then, you know, we've identified, again, I, I think if, if you gave a, world, a bunch of world language departments a list of 100,000 people with advanced, advanced level language skills, wouldn't they be thrilled to get those? Uh, but they don't know they exist. So part of it is how do we create the connections, that articulation between the two? And I think that creates change. Um, I know from one, of, some of the schools are really providing, they're telling, uh, you know, if you want to get college credit for your seal of biliteracy, you have to have an articulation meeting with the department chair. So the department chair can pitch your program and whatever it is you have to offer. So I think there's some creative ways that can, can be done. But um, I mean, the data is there. It builds retention, not just in the high school mm -hmm. programs, but also in the college level programs when they implement it. Uh, yeah, there was a question from Caitlin Walsh, actually, from the interpreters uh, area at the American Translators Association. And she says, absolutely floored by the amazing success Emma's reporting. She's wondering if it also involved engaging with parents and families as partners. Do higher digital languages create communication barriers that prevent parents from advocating for their kids when they suspect they are not in the right classes? And I, I see Emma's dropped off of our panel. Uh, I'm not sure if she had lost her connectivity. Um, let me just see. I don't see her listed there in on the panel. So um, we can ask her that question and uh, see if we can, uh, when we connect up again. But what I will say is that I think very few parents uh, ever question the placement of their kids in language classes with the exception of families who have kids in dual language. And I don't know about the heritage pro, pro, the heritage parents. They're a little less like, I mean, I think they're generally not likely to question any kind of placements, to, to be honest. They just don't even really know about what opportunities they have. Um, the, the highly educated uh, families that are immigrant families that are working, say, at Microsoft, we have a lot of those that are Russian, Ukrainian, Romanian, et cetera. Those families, Bulgarians, they advocate a lot and they have come up with districts, for example, that decided, well, we'll offer the testing, but only for languages that have stamp tests. So if you're Bulgarian, sorry, you can't get the state seal of biliteracy in this small district, which is the most the richest district in the state. That's, you know, that's inequitable. Yeah. So those are some of the challenges we're trying to deal with in terms of equity of opportunity for every student to potentially get the state seal of biliteracy if they can develop language skills over time. Um, I do know that about the experience in Mount Vernon from what she described that there was a lot of communications to families to understand like why they were testing, why the credit, you know, why the, the schedules were changing in October and why it, their student is likely to be more successful if they're in a, in a more advanced class and things like that. Um, the other thing is that they were very careful, I, as I saw the letters that she that they prepared to indicate that if a student, for example, earned enough credits to um, meet the two credit uh, requirement, so-called requirement for high school graduation that we have in our state now, uh, or for college admissions, or to earn the state seal of biliteracy, for example, they were strongly encouraged to consider uh, attending uh, this French class, which is taught by Catherine Ousselin, who's a fabulous French teacher. And so I don't think she lost any enrollment, honestly. I think something like 70% of her students are, are um, uh, Latin, Latinx students from the community. Um, anyway, 
Um, but that is a very good question, Caitlin, about the, the engagement with families. That has always been a struggle is how to get the word out to families adequately to know to advocate for these because you are countering messaging that has been happening since their children, since they arrived or when their children were born, that get rid of that other language. This is about English in this country. And we still see it happening. I just can't believe it. No matter how many years I work on this stuff, it still happens. Uh, some more questions, maybe. Let me just go check the Q&A here. Uh, oh, Emma, you're back. Can you say something to that, Emma, about the, about the community engagement, the family engagement in that question? And I also note another question that Larisa is here from our Russian Heritage Language Grant. We are going to add Ukrainians, so I will send you the interest forms if you can start getting students to sign up. That would help us a lot. I've and got a I couple of Ukrainian students to send your way, actually. We've got a whole family we're hoping to sign up for. <laughs> yay, yay, yeah. <laughs> Um, yeah, I, thank you, Michelle, for I'm, I'm so glad that you know what we're doing and you've been help, so helpful in this process and could describe some of the work that we're doing with our families. Um, I do think that one of the reasons why this is so necessary is because families are frequently not part of the conversation of how their students' education has proceeded. Um, and this, in addition to stopping some registration policies that were not as inclusive or as um, accurate as they should be also provided an opportunity to create new relationships with families that may not have had an opportunity to discuss their child's education from the framework of who they are. Um, not all multilingual programs have the same outlook or relationship that we have with our families, but by tying these programs together in this journey, we've been able to leverage the relationships that we do have. Um, and also we've been describing that you can't learn one language and not your other language and expect both languages mm -hmm. to work. Right. So um, really being able to frame this for families as we are, we are learning. <laughs> and that that learning is interdependent and so we want your child in this Spanish class because we see it as a way for their entire language proficiency to come up and to have the English teacher say that is it has helped to combat some of those families who have heard from other people that they need to wait or who's um you know the adults in the family had the unfortunate experience um, of growing up in the time when people were encouraged not to speak Spanish at home. And so it, it really has been a gift to the family engagement piece and you can't do this without choosing to engage in that. And I, I, I'm not sure it wouldn't be different um, from a community aspect if they were younger students or older either. I think it, it's just necessary every time. That's amazing. <laughs> yeah, thank you very much. Um, I'm just kind of looking through the list of attendees and uh, I see my friend An Chung Chung is here and Amy Ota, Alegria, nice to see you again. I loved your presentation last week and Daniela from Bulgarians, Donna, Kristen, Larissa is here. She's put some questions Q and A. I'm sorry, you can't just speak out. Although I guess actually we can promote somebody to speaking, but is, is there any, are, do you guys have any thoughts about this? What do you think about what we've been talking about today? Well, think about whether you'd like to say something. Okay, yeah, because we can promote anybody who would like to speak. So if there's anybody who would like to say something, Angelica, you're here too. I see that we've got an Urdu speaker, Batul Moin, is there? And of course, um, let's see, I've got somebody in chat who said, okay, oh yeah, that's Russ. Okay, um, well, I know it's been a long day for Maria. It's been a long day for Linda in particular, uh, like, especially because you're on East Coast time. Um, <laughs> What do we see as the next steps, Maria? You know, you talked about the credentialing uh, in the morning session and why you felt that was a forward direction. I totally agree. I feel like it's, to me, it's almost like the foundation in the sense that if you don't have a way of recognizing what people can do, um, there's not, a, it's hard to find the motivation to like build the house in a sense, the structure. And, uh, and so I totally agree with you on that, but what are you thinking? What are you seeing uh, beyond the kinds of things that we've been sharing? Uh, well, what I have seen 
that is that students are very interested in credentialing in something that attests to what they can do in, in, in their language and that is rigorous. At the same time, I have to, and that's encouraging. I love, I'm talking about college students at my institution. That's, I can't generalize. At the same time, I have to be honest, the faculty don't give a damn. <laughs> I mean, it, it's really remarkable. Um, it, there's um, a little bit of an arrogance thing where you know, universities say, we decide what counts. You know, you have to follow our courses as if that were some kind of, that provided some kind of measurement of what individuals can do with the language, not so. But there is that mindset, and, and Linda, you were mentioning community colleges. I did a study of community colleges a while ago, I wanna say maybe six or seven years ago, there were very few lang heritage languages taught in California. Right. When we know that that is a starting point in higher ed for many heritage language speakers. So there is a terrible disconnect between uh, um, post-secondary education and these issues that have been brought up here, these initiatives that have been brought up here. Um, Emma, as I was listening to you, I was thinking, boy, teachers are much more educated about these topics than our professors, much more forward thinking. So, um, uh, and that is because in language departments, you don't just have language teachers or people who work with language, but you have the other um, areas of instruction. So Michelle, you asked me, where do you see this going? I think the initiative has to come from the lower grades and then higher ed will catch up. There's just, there's no progressive sense, or there's very little, and, and what there is is considered, well, that's not serious stuff, that's not for academics. And I think, um, I think Emma talked uh, about this, and Linda, once departments, department, language departments at the college level are struggling and yet I see a lot of inertia to change things. And once they start to see that they're drowning, I mean, do something, the, the kinds of things that you're advocating will really become important. But in the meantime, I just see a lot of inertia, frankly, to doing this, even though it makes so much sense, even though it helps our students so much, even though it helps a community of um, heritage language speakers uh, in the United States. And as you saw the report from the 2017 um, from America's Languages talked about the need to build capacity in, in languages, right? So there's just this disconnect and this lack of ability to see what's coming, the inevitable, right? I think Russ just promoted Lariska Shavalova, who is our one of our Russian instructor, one of our Russian instructors along with Alexei this year in the Heritage Language Grant that we're doing. But she herself had worked for years as an ELL instructor. So she had been working with a whole variety, kind of like Emma. In fact, Larissa, I kind of feel like you should go do in, in Bellingham what Emma's been doing in Mount Vernon. I know it's there's some advantages when it's a, a slightly small, well, quite a bit smaller district uh, to get things going, but I think we've got to leverage these things. So Larissa, welcome. Thanks for you know, joining here. Uh, do you have some comments you want to make? Because you, you're working with heritage speakers all the time, plus you've worked with English learners in general and districts and all of the kind of administrative hassles that Emma has talked about too. Yes, thank you. I'm sorry, my voice is getting back to me, but not completely. So I'm struggling. Uh, but I just wanted to say there's such a wonderful thing to uh, make this uh, test, the uh, proficiency test available to all of the students and, and then have this information shared with all of the teachers too. And I just wanted to make sure that uh, all the teachers, everybody think about is like a great asset and I think it changes the environment of um, the whole school and everything. And it's really the answer to the question um, of, of the fear of some students and families to kind of show that they speak other language. 
so it kind of changes everything uh changes everything and then uh students are proud of what they can do in their language and they can show it and they're not afraid they're not hiding it and that's what we want right we want them um to have this intrinsic motivation to uh, proceed in their studies yeah that was just my comment that i wanted to share yeah thank you actually larissa it's interesting that you should say that because somebody wrote a question comment um for my presentation and this person said that she was told that in her school there were no russian speakers and she said yeah. i know 10 oh that was you okay i know 10 <laughs> families in the school so there's that fear of revealing because automatically you are just seen through that lens as a student you're seen and the lens is typically the english language learner lens which is not a great lens to be seen through right so um that's a great point that um, something like certification may turn things around. And I'm wondering, the schools themselves, can they get something out of it? Do they get something? Do they Can they get some special recognition? Is there something that will make them promote this out of self-interest? I think that we should look into that, Emma, and really pursue that with Patty in particular, because the seal of biliteracy legislation in Washington required that there be reports, which uh, Veronica shared today about the results, but they wanted to see more than anything, what is the percentage of students getting the state seal compared to the percentage of students who are qualified for ELL services? And so if there's like, if it's really mm -hmm. skewed, if we're not doing the languages of the students who are to be served uh, with English learner services, then uh, then we're not, you know, then they're going to take it away from us, you know? <laughs> and so that's part of the reason we have so many languages, because it was written in from the beginning. There was concern on the legislation, the legislator's part, that a seal of biliteracy would become one more perk for advantaged students and would disadvantage the very students who had the languages. And so we, that's part of why we have made such a personal commitment to working to that, to, to make that happen. Um, but why shouldn't we be actually calling out schools that are, you know, schools that, I mean, granted, if you don't have very many students of different languages, then it's not your fault you don't have too many, uh, other than the fact that maybe you should have been offering more world languages. But for those students, those schools that do, if they're not getting that percentage up, or even if we don't do it in a punitive way, but just call out the ones that have uh, the highest percentage of students, that uh, high percentage of, of, of uh, students qualified or students with the other home language and a high percentage of state seal by literacy, that would be a great thing to point out, I think. Don't you think, Emma, that if that would be one way yeah. to get schools to get it on their radar? I do. I also think um, from the district perspective, Washington State um, has set up some things that you don't see in other states. So we have competitive grants that require us to be able to to speak to multilingualism. Um, we have a, a, there's a competitive grant that's open right now that is a adaptive technology grant that actually names Tech, adaptive technology for learning English as a language of instruction. I'm saying it that way instead of the other way. But um, and so we have funds available, and and we know that a lot of our our colleagues that are not language colleagues but are educators or administrators in public education. Sometimes that can be the thing that makes them look at it. So I feel like we could be a model for how this might work, um, not just in the number of languages we test, but also in the way we benefit school districts. That's great. And we uh, will keep that in mind in our state and where we can go with that. But then also, Linda, we would love to have your help to make sure we get it to the national level, especially with the BEST Act, because it's sort of theoretical at the moment. And uh, what concretely will the BEST Act do to actually get the seal of uh, biliteracy uh, equitably distributed across the country in terms of students benefiting and languages benefiting? So I, I'm sure there's more we could talk about here, I, uh, but we're at five, uh, my time, 531, which I guess is 231, your time. Uh, let's see, I see uh, lots of great things. Uh, thank you very much for all the positive comments. Uh, I think we're gonna close it here, Russ. Do you have any more words for the 
good of the order or Paul and thank you Paul and Russ in the Language Learning Center for making it possible for us to, to uh, do this uh, annual event and definitely our committee on uh, uh, multilingual language research, or learning research and teaching uh, with uh, Anna and, uh, and now Angelica who has joined it as well. Thank you, Maria. Thank you, Linda. Thank you, Emma, so much. And Larissa also for joining us, Rosa, for earlier. Okay, I think that's a wrap. <laughs>